in this episode of Plants of the Gods. We continue about tobacco, one of the most widely used mind-altering substances. In the second half of this two-part discussion, we'll hear about some of Dr. Plotkin's own experiences with tobacco and how indigenous peoples in Amazonia use this sacred plant. On a recent visit to Oaxaca, Mexico, I was deep in ceremony with the mushroom masters of the Mazatec peoples when my experience took a dark and frightening turn. The shaman helped shield me by rolling up my sleeves and vigorously rubbing green tobacco powder into the insides of my elbows, which he insisted would protect me from the dark forces which were threatening me. In fact, my first introduction to tobacco use in the rainforest began more than four decades earlier, during an expedition to the northeast Amazon in search of giant crocodilians. Here's how I describe the experience in my first book, Tales of a Shaman's Apprentice. That night was the last of the expedition, and we were on the river until daybreak, recording data about the small caimans we were able to catch. George the boatman beached the canoe, and we were scratching our mosquito bites as the sun rose a soft but fiery red over the rainforest-covered mountains to the east. When he finished unloading the equipment, George reached under his seat and pulled out a small aluminum can. Using his right thumb to push off the tightly capped lid, he poured the viscous black liquid into his left palm and then noisily snorted it up. His eyes rolled back, his right leg began to twitch. When he returned to reality several minutes later, I was still standing there watching him. He smiled, adjusted the angle of his hat, and passed me the can. Your turn, he said. This was the moment of truth. To decline would be rude, to accept foolhardy. Thousands of questions raced through my mind. Never in a classroom had I been taught what to do in such a situation. In the years that followed, I would have shaman swing machetes at my neck, treat my various illnesses with jungle plants, and blow copious amounts of hallucinogenic snuff deep into my nostrils. But I knew nothing yet. I stuck out my hand. With a slight grin, George poured the black liquid into my palm. I rapidly snorted the dark potion. In the back of my throat, I tasted a bitter substance, but this was soon forgotten. I felt the blood coursing through my veins and felt increasingly omniscient and all-powerful. I was a rocket blasting off, and with each passing second, I felt higher, faster, stronger, and more alive. But after a short voyage, I ran out of fuel. First, I felt weak, then slow, then queasy, then outright nauseous. I broke out in a sweat, collapsed on the ground, and vomited three times. Half an hour later, I'd made enough of a recovery to stagger back to my hut and stumble into my hammock. Despite persistent nausea and a slight ringing in my ears, I fell into a deep yet restless sleep. When I awoke several hours later, my colleague Mittermeier had already packed our things for the return trip. George came by and gave a hearty laugh when he saw my still green complexion. What the hell was in that, I asked, somewhat uncertainly. My secret recipe, he replied. The leaves of the tobacco bush and the ashes of the mahokoshon tree. Would you like some more? George pulled the can out of a pocket in his shorts and offered it to me. Before I could vehemently decline, he burst out laughing. End of quote. Nicotine can be addictive as well as lethal. Many popular accounts note that a single drop of the purified substance can kill a person if applied directly to the skin of the tongue, but it has undeniable therapeutic properties. Nicotine can, for example, ease pain, enhance cognition, reduce stress, and suppress appetite. These attributes explain in large part why photos taken after battles often show soldiers with cigars in their mouths or cigarettes between their fingers. According to Narby and Pizzuri, tobacco has been studied by scientists more than any other plant in the history of science due, among other factors, to its chemical complexity. Tobacco produces about 4,000 different organic compounds. Yet despite all of these investigations, we are still learning astonishing facts about tobacco and nicotine. Narby and Pizzuri write about a caterpillar known to some indigenous peoples as the mother of tobacco. 
It is an actual insect known as the tobacco hornworm, scientific name Manduca sexta, which produces a specific protein that binds to nicotine and neutralizes it. This allows the caterpillar to munch on tobacco leaves with impunity. It also allows the animal to exhale nicotine-laden breath, which deters predatory spiders. This insect's mastery of nicotine is still not fully understood, though scientists have been looking into it for more than 50 years. End of quote. In fact, many of the alkaloids like nicotine we have discussed in Plants of the Gods, compounds such as codeine, morphine, psilocybin, and scopolamine, were not synthesized by plants and fungi to inspire Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band, but actually to deter insect predation. Nicotine is the example par excellence. In bug-ridden corners of the rainforest, particularly near whitewater rivers, as explained in my most recent book on the Amazon, I'll either light up a cigarette or cigar or wet the tobacco and rub it onto my face and arms. It is a highly effective insect repellent. As we've heard, tobacco was first brought to Europe by the Spaniards and then spread around the world at lightning speed. Within 100 years of Columbus's encounter with tobacco-smoking peoples in the Caribbean in 1492, European explorers in remote corners of northeastern Siberia found indigenous people smoking tobacco, meaning that tobacco had moved around the world faster than any other spice or food plant in recorded history. Seemingly, Everywhere tobacco was introduced, it was initially lauded as a medicine, often as a panacea. It was employed to treat every conceivable ill, from migraines to malaria, from bacterial infections to the Black Plague. And in one of history's cruelest irony, it was used in many cases to treat cancers. Meanwhile, tobacco was celebrated in art, even as it was condemned in politics and policies. In his play Don Juan, the French playwright Moliere has one of his characters claim, quote, not only does tobacco exhilarate and purify the human brain, but it also instructs the soul in virtue, and one learns to be a gentleman. The British writer Edward Bulwer-Lytton also waxed poetic, quote, tobacco ripens the brain, it opens the heart, and the man who smokes it thinks like a sage and acts like a Samaritan. King James, best known as the monarch who sponsored the much-beloved English translation of the Christian Bible for the Church of England, was adamantly opposed to tobacco for much of his reign, especially when his advisors told him that purchases of tobacco from the Spanish colonies were so great that it was depleting England's silver supply. Furthermore, he considered smoking to be a filthy habit. In his famous essay, Counterblast to Tobacco, he thundered, Quote, it is a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs, and in the black stinking fume thereof, nearest resembling the horrible Stygian smoke of the pit that is bottomless. Benjamin Waterhouse, the first physician to test smallpox vaccine in the U.S., he actually tested her on his own family members, and he was a co-founder of the Harvard Medical School, was also not a fan of tobacco, but wrote with a much lighter touch than did King James. Quote, Tobacco was an Indian weed. It was the devil sowed the seed. It drains the pocket, singes the clothes, and makes a chimney of the nose. End of quote. This ambivalence towards tobacco goes back to the very beginning of the introduction of tobacco to the outside world, if not before. According to historian Henry Hobhouse, quote, In 1700, European indentured and ex-indentured servants very comfortably outnumbered African slaves in the Chesapeake colonies. But by the year of the Declaration of Independence, 1776, that is just 75 years later, there were virtually no white indentured servants remaining, and the black population of Virginia had increased to 40 percent, end of quote. In other words, as slaves on tobacco plantations. Tobacco became so valuable in the 13 colonies that it was sometimes used as currency. 
As I mentioned earlier, the soaring demand in Europe created large fortunes in Virginia, also Maryland and the Carolinas, where tobacco grew best, but caused untold misery and evil to an enslaved Afro-American labor force as the colonial economy shifted from subsistence agriculture to aggressive capitalism. At the outset, the Spaniards managed to maintain a monopoly on tobacco since it was grown and exported to Europe from their American colonies, such as Cuba. Other European powers attempted to break the monopoly by creating their own tobacco plantations in their own American colonies. Although Columbus had brought Taino cigars from America to his patron Queen Isabella, interest in European cultivation of tobacco really began when André Thévé delivered tobacco seeds to France from South America in 1556. Thévé was a Franciscan priest who had observed the fearsome Tupinamba people smoking tobacco during tribal dances near Rio de Janeiro, which was then a French colony. A few years later, in 1560, the French diplomat Jean Nicot, ambassador to Portugal, of which Brazil was then a colony, brought tobacco to France and wildly oversold its virtues as a panacea. Nevertheless, a rivalry sprung up between Teve and Nico as to whom had done more to popularize tobacco in Europe. The matter was settled when Linnaeus, the father of scientific classification, named the genus Nicotiana, thus immortalizing Nico and leaving Teve to be relatively forgotten by comparison. To add insult to injury, two German chemists at the University of Heidelberg isolated the active principle from tobacco in 1828, and they named it nicotine, further immortalizing Jean Nicot, who had brought tobacco to Europe four years later than his forgotten rival, André Thévé. Nonetheless, the Spanish monopoly was decisively broken when tobacco was planted in the Virginia colony in 1611 by John Rolfe, an English colonist best known to history as the man who married Pocahontas, whose real name was Matuaka. The supposed secret of Rolf's success was that he planted seeds of Nicotiana tobacco that had been smuggled out of Trinidad, then a Spanish colony, to the Americas. This species yielded a much milder, appealing, and marketable tobacco than the harsh Nicotiana rustica it had replaced. Within a decade of Rolf's first plantings, tobacco was fast becoming the American colony's major export since, according to economic botanist Burl Simpson, an acre planted to tobacco was worth four times an acre planted to corn. However, the specter of cancer is seldom far from the usage of tobacco. Most Americans mistakenly believe that the link between smoking and cancer wasn't discovered until the 1960s, but the very first report linking overuse of tobacco to cancer was published by Sir John Hill in the year 1761. The business community's successful efforts to hide the harmful effects of tobacco for so long is one of the ugliest and most lethal episodes in the history of capitalism. Not only did they hide what they knew to be the harmful effects of nicotine, but they actually promoted these products as healthy. In the 1950s, the decade in which I was born, pregnant women were not only assured that tobacco wasn't harmful to the fetus, but that cigarettes were effective for helping control weight gain during pregnancy. The cover-up by the tobacco companies was featured and explained brilliantly in 1999 film entitled The Insider. Highly recommended. This long and well-funded opposition to public health controls by the tobacco companies meant that it wasn't until 2008 that the World Health Organization, the WHO, named tobacco as the world's greatest preventable cause of death. Many years ago, when I asked Takuma, the great Kamayura shaman of the Brazilian Xingu region, why his tobacco-smoking people never seemed to get cancer, he smiled and said, quote, I will show you. He handed me a long and thin shamanic cigar, lit one himself, and we puffed contentedly side by side. Once we'd finished, he handed me a gourd with a foamy liquid 
and instructed me to drink it all as fast as I could. I did as he instructed, and I vomited it all back up immediately. He smiled and said, quote, In life, we take in a lot of poisons. If you purge regularly, whether through smoking tobacco, taking ayahuasca, or drinking shamanic soapy liquids, you will be purified and healthy. Would you like another cigar? If you've enjoyed this podcast, please remember to give us a good rating and to subscribe and share with like-minded folks. We appreciate your support for the protection of the knowledge and biodiversity of South America by the Amazon Conservation Team. In our next episode, join us for part one of a two-part episode featuring ethnobotanist Dr. Glenn Shepard in conversation with Dr. Plockett. 